does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hartness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I am on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Kate Spacek, and we speak about embodiment and how to bring the bodies back into the space that we facilitate. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, scroll down to the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Hi, Kate. Welcome to the show. Hi, Miriam. How's it going today? Good. I'm curious to talk to you and the movement of belonging. And I always start with the same question. <laughs> you cannot get around it. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? I do not. Not purposely. I started facilitating. My first coaching group was back in 2007 or eight. So I suppose that's when I started being a facilitator. I started seeing myself or felt like a facilitator, not until maybe 2011 or 12 when I was leading an art of play series. And then I just, I don't really think of myself in that way. I do use the verb a lot though, to describe my work. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why that is. My guess is there's probably an underlying fear there, like a fear of not meeting some perceived expectation of what it means to be a facilitator with capital F, right? Yet when I think about the root of the word to make things easier, I very much aim towards that or gravitate towards that being a primary foundation of my work. Mm. So I don't know, maybe I'll maybe I'll make a business card that just says Kate Spacek facilitator and see how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny for those who don't watch the video, the moment where you spoke, oh facilitator was capital F, something happened in your body, kind of Straighten up a little bit, shoulders back. Uh huh. I believe that. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe I. I think even just knowing that we were going to talk today has brought an awareness of what it means to facilitate into my psyche in a deeper way. So mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing what sprouts from that. Yeah. And I would love to hear what has emerge. So what does it mean to facilitate? And you sparked my curiosity when you mentioned the art of play. Mm, mm -hmm. I, made this that up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, I made that up as the title of a six month weekly series I was producing or facilitating when I lived in Indonesia. And the cool part about that geography was that my intention was to investigate what is play? What is play for me? What is play for others? And can I ignite play? Mm -hmm. And what are the ways to do that? And because it was in Bali, there was a lot of tourism, but also a lot of different languages and cultures so very often I would be trying to lead a, I think they were 90 minutes, maybe once a week, a different group of people. It was not a closed container. So a different group of people coming from all different places. And very often we did not have a common spoken language. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways it fueled my purpose to see if play could be a common language. And that's what I ended up discovering is I tried to use as many different mediums and formats. And today we'll use movement or sound or paint or anything you can think of. Games, lots of 
games that I either knew or I designed to prototype and test and found out that, yes, play is a really important piece of belonging. I didn't know that at the time, but looking back, that has become a key ingredient. Mm. So is a facilitator someone who creates belonging? I Yes, I think I can say yes wholeheartedly. And I say yes because not only simply put, are you, are you trying to create ease with whatever the purpose or the mission of the facilitation is, but also thinking about to, to feel a sense of belonging is to feel ease, to feel acceptance, to feel wholeness, I think. I think, I feel, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Belonging is a is a big word, and when I think of group work, so as a facilitator, we work with groups, and one way to create psychological safety so that we can express ourselves and become the best version of ourselves is to feel a sense of belonging, at least for the time that the group comes together. Mm -hmm. mm. So what does it mean to facilitate for you? I think to support participants, to support the group, to find, to investigate, do, feel. I mean, I think it would help to have an example maybe, but to the art of play, we'll use the art of play series. To facilitate that is to support the group and the individuals in the group to experience play in a way that feels easeful. It might not feel good. Mm, ooh, it doesn't have to feel good. But there's ease in the transmission of the experience, right? Yeah, and I love the distinction that it doesn't have to feel good. Because, yeah, often it's it's scary, it's uncomfortable. It might be conflict either between each other or within ourselves. Right. And I'm probably jumping ahead, but that's a big reason why belonging is such a challenge is we all long to belong, but to belong is to sense oneself. And that means to sense all of it, the things that are less comfortable and the things that are more comfortable. Mm. And without that wholeness, we cannot belong. Mm. And what just came up for me was a wonder whether it's something active or passive. Can you say more? Because somehow belonging is feels for me like a stability, something that is, that we... It's either there or it's not. It's present or it's absent. But then do we have to be active to belong? Or is it something where we can just be passive and experience belonging? Mm. Well, I would say that your word experience right there points us to the answer. Because to experience belonging is to be aware and to be aware is to be in your felt sense and that is an action that's mm -hmm. an active practice and that's where the discomfort comes in for many right mm -hmm. hopefully for everyone we all carry discomfort and the the awareness and presence and being with it eventually could get us to maybe loving it first accepting it yeah and belonging inherently points to relationship but can only come from within we cannot give belonging to someone else we cannot make them feel belonging all we can do is belong to ourselves and invite them to belong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and give them space to not feel like they have to fit in You know, it requires looking at and releasing our patterns that block our true sense of belonging. So, you know, that shows up a lot as 
compulsive compassion or wanting to fit in or people pleasing or staying silent. And yeah, I, I'm maybe I'm rambling. <laughs> Not at all. You're exploring. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Well, then thinking about facilitating a group, any conversation on belonging needs to be including a conversation about our systemic isms, right? Because we could belong full to the brim to ourselves, but still be swimming upstream in the you know systemic inequities and cultures that we create. And so to be aware of that piece is a big piece when trying to foster a sense of belonging or facilitate any group. Because without that, like we can tell people, oh, you just have to accept yourself and accept your quote unquote flaws. And our sense of belonging to others is limited by our sense of belonging to self. But then you take the young black woman or the Asian or Latinx immigrant who speaks English as a second language, and that person could be fully committed to their personal growth work and they really cultivated their connection to themselves and even their reverence for themselves. And then that person steps up on the podium or offers input at a work meeting or asks for pain meds at the hospital. And then that audience or those colleagues or that doctor might be having thoughts rooted in our systemic isms, our racism and sexism and mm -hmm. all of that, that is, you know, having thoughts like, oh, she must have played the race card to get that speaking role. Or this person's pain tolerance is plenty high. They don't need the pain meds. They must be faking it. And so how can that person ever feel a true sense of belonging in that context? Mm. So that's what I mean by swimming upstream. I feel that at least I'll only speak for the U.S. culture, that in this country, I think some people have more access to belonging than others. Mm. And in terms of belonging to self, yeah, just because it requires a lot more effort for some people. And because the confrontation to unconscious bias is just all around. Right. If you're not a white, cisgendered, able-bodied, English-speaking, et cetera, et cetera, person with those identities, then you're navigating this kind of friction every single day. And so that's something that, you know, every day I gain, I hope, gain more understanding around and what it means for me to show up in this work at the same time like i make sure that that's present for me but systemic oppression is a mighty machine and in my work i'm choosing to focus on the smaller scale approaches yeah. starting with self and then extending to immediate circles of partnership family community and adding some levity and creativity in there. Thank you for yeah, peeling the onion, so to speak, of the complexity where belonging actually starts. Mm -hmm. And then how do you then, knowing about all this complexity, how do you start to help the individuals of the group to feel the, or at least to open up to the possibility of belonging because you cannot force it right you can say oh yeah you belong right as you mentioned earlier it's it's a sensation it's you cannot decide it for someone mm -hmm. so what are the ingredients the onion metaphor i think is a good one that belonging is actually always there it's a universal truth we all belong all the time and yet we long for it and so the game is to allow ourselves to sense it and for longer and longer periods of time. And so I think peeling away what gets in the way is the game. And that's a radical act. 
it's displacing judgment with insatiable curiosity. You mentioned curiosity, I think, before we pressed record. And that's a word that I just have plastered all over my life because I find it to be challenging to Mm -hmm. stay in that curious place. And so I need the reminders, being curious about ourselves in the present moment, feeling into the aliveness. I, I have a yoga mat from like 2009. It's going strong. And at the top of it, I wrote in Sharpie, find what feels good mm. a couple of years ago. And then I crossed out good in the last year and wrote alive because we're so, I'm so conditioned to just wanting to feel what feels good and that it actually takes a lot of effort which you could also call love. It takes a lot of effort to let yourself see the dark stuff. The, you know, I I want to feel my joy and my flow and my excitement, but what does it mean to also feel the jealousy and the insecurities and the embarrassment and the anger or even more difficult for me sometimes is to feel the mundane to feel mm. them because belonging means to love all of that. And love might be a, a tough stretch for many of us, but at least to start accepting it. Mm. And so what I try to do with my work is find more accessible, playful practices to try that on before it becomes I don't know, high stakes in your primary relationship and you have all these emotional blocks to feeling what feels scary because we weren't taught to do that, right? To the contrary, we were taught to think about our traits as good or bad or right or wrong. And we, we've been trained to take certain parts of ourselves and lock them up. and. If we let them out of the cage, then we were punished. And we're taught that, you know, pleasure is a reward and that pain is a punishment versus just feeling them as sensations. Mm. Like it's such a joke that we're all striving for this pleasure, this ecstasy, whatever that means, but we're not actually taught to feel it, like to really feel it in the body. And maybe if we were, we wouldn't be chasing it so much. I don't know. And then, so it takes work to uproot all these biases. And I think there are a lot of tools to do that. Mm. I use movement mostly because I discovered that as my own mode and because I find it to be reliable. Thank you. I'm fascinated. (laughs) There's so much to unpeel. And again, I've uh, rarely done that to point at the video recording, actually, because I find it fascinating how your body moves with your expression. Mm. And when you express yourself of what's going on, the story completes by how you, yeah, your body language. I appreciate that reflection. I imagine that it probably wasn't like that 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. And that you see me close my eyes a lot. And part of that is to block out other senses so that I can get my brain straight. But I think what's happening is I'm actually feeling somewhere in my body to see if maybe they'll give me the answers. <laughs> yeah. And it's, um, and this is for me the bridge to come to the movement and how you use that in your practice. So how Do you get, because I think that many of us, if we do have facial expression that already wow, Mm -hmm. then to have the body language that goes with us, um, I think it's very vulnerable actually because it's another, it's a deeper layer of exposure. Saying something is one thing, showing it on our faces is another one and supporting it with other body language. So how do you use movement in your work and how do you teach people to use it? So I think an important framework to this 
is that we know the mind likes to be in the future or in the past, but the body can't do that. The body is always present. And that's why so many mindfulness or meditation techniques rely on the breath because it's always right there where it is. It can't move in time. And so I guess I started playing around. Well, I don't know if I should talk about the origin story or if I talk about what I do now. Um, uh, what about both? You can start at the origin. <laughs> Okay, we'll start where we began. So I was going through a rough patch, like we often do. And I was finding that dancing was making me feel better. I don't have any formal dance training, but just throwing music on, moving around in the living room, I started going to some local dance events. And I noticed that there was something more to it than the usual benefits of exercise. I noticed that I was always closing my eyes and that I was shifting my attention from outside myself to inside my skin. And that I was actually becoming playmates with the sensations of my movements. And maybe we can try a little bit right now. Like just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Okay, if you just shake your hand above your heart and you shake, 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 shake your booty and shake the other hand, or maybe a little wiggle, jiggle in the shoulders. All right, and then bring the hands back down and come to a place of stillness and take your attention from anything else into your hands. And feel that pulsing or maybe prickly sensations. You can feel movement in your hands. It's like champagne bubbles of aliveness. <laughs> and I, I like to think that those are my cells saying, thank you, thank you. And so those sensations I started to, to just play with. And I noticed that it was helping me get more comfortable with my own body. I have a history of, uh, like most women in the US, <laughs> I have a history of body image issues, disordered eating. And so being inside and not worrying about what it looked like, but just what the sensations felt like began to have me just feeling better about myself. And this isn't a new discovery, it's ancient, but it was new to me at the time. And so part of my practice then that became my art practice was inventing these movement recipes. And they would just pop in my brain as I was dancing, like, like, hey, this feels like what I would imagine soft serve ice cream would feel like coming out of the machine, right? And so then I would real quick jot down words that I thought could get me back to that or to replicate that somehow. And eventually I ended up facilitating these recipes, but I didn't know I was doing that at the time. And I would just like that one I call swirl. And so they become these little, almost like poems that are based in this kinesthetic art. And I was having a blast with it. And so then I started to investigate why, why this was happening. And so I feel like I came to a universal truth, but through the backwards route or through the back door of my own discoveries. And I started holding public events and doing uh, movement recipes with groups. I called the event social movement. Mm -hmm. And then with my private clients, I was reading about it, talking about it. And that's when Movement of Belonging, more or less, was born back in 2017, 2018. And so it became a formula of using my like yoga and meditation, mindfulness background um, from a long time ago. 
but doing something more with it, adding this focused attention on the sensations and then teaching myself how to be with what is. And that's the, the inclusion of diverse experiences, right? Which Mm -hmm. ties into the acceptance and the belonging that if you can do it inside, maybe we'll be better at doing it on the outside, which is kind of a separate, not separate, very connected, but separate from your question. So then I also have learned through my studies around play and through different work I've had the opportunity to do in facilitating arts incubators that were aimed at community creative collaboration to address social challenges. And so I was taking all these pieces, the movement, which is just good for us, like exercise is good for us, with the focused attention, which is just the meditation piece, but the focused attention on the sensations, which develops the embodied awareness, but then adding this play and the creative agency. Because I feel that that creativity piece is like an extra boost because when we feel like the artists of our bodies that we're so often disconnected from, there's a, there's an autonomy and agency there that, oh, I belong to myself, right? And I mean, just in recent months, have I been able to understand the the terminology to put to the formula or that it even was a formula? That is a long answer to your short question. (laughs) And what a beautiful answer. Thank you. Mm. There, I parked one thing that you said that um, doing it on the inside is one thing and doing it on the outside is another thing, which pointed in another direction than my question. And I would love to follow that one, especially because... I wonder how you then build the bridge between this inner experience that feels so so strong of finding this moment of to feel it, to be present with ourselves, the body, and feel comfortable, but then opening the eyes and doing this in community that feels like extra scary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what needs to be present or what needs to be absent? <laughs> Mm. to do this as a and I love it that you call it social movement because yes it's it's movement being socially which then can become a social movement I guess Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ideally and I also want to mention and give respect to all of the activists and organizers out in the world who are working their butts off to to generate social movements to effect major change. I I often say I'm glad somebody is trying to save the dolphins because it's needed, but it's and we can't all save the dolphins. We all need to just grab the thing that we are best suited for. And for me, the social movement that I'm wanting to propagate is based in a bit of levity and a bit of creativity, but it's not any less impactful, I think. Mm. So if a social movement is based on shared understanding of and connection with a particular need or a desire And then I imagine that all the individuals in that social movement are more powerful when each individual is alive, like alive, alive with the capital A. (laughs) And to be that kind of alive requires sensing your own body, being aware of what it's like to be inside your body. A lot of my inspiration comes from Sebene Selassie who wrote a book a few years ago called You Belong. I highly recommend it. And like, if she were listening to this, she'd be thinking like, this girl is just using all my words. (laughs) And hopefully she would be um, appreciative of that because she's such a gift. But so when I have the events, people are 
all over the spectrum of comfortability. You know, some people absolutely would not call themselves a dancer and they're not going to call themselves an artist. One of my favorite little personal missions is to shift that in people <laughs> to help to help them embrace their inner artist and their inner dancer. But that's not a goal. It's just it's a nice cherry on top. So with people at all different levels of comfortability, obviously we need to start with things that you can't screw up, right? I encourage people to close their eyes because then nobody's watching you. <laughs> and and we we play with recipes that it's like they get you so into your head that you are not in your head. For example, what does it feel like if your elbows are melting? And if we were to move along the wall, even facing the wall so that you can't see anyone, nobody can see you. But what do your elbows do if they're melting on the wall? Mm. Just things that are so abstract that you, you can't look cool. You can't look cool tiptoeing across a gymnasium floor while your elbows are melting. And I find that with that levity comes some safety. It creates a, an even playing field, kind of like when in the arts incubator, we would have the city council member and the student both having to create the uh, community map out of pipe cleaners or something like that. It's You're leveling the playing field because we're tapping into something that's innate as a human and that you can't screw it up. Your mm -hmm. elbows melting is different from somebody else's. And so then when we're more aware of this felt sense and we're doing it in the presence of others, it's like this more complete version becomes available to open to new ideas, to new people, to things that are quote unquote out there outside of me or things that are different from me. And the other end starts to collapse a little bit. Mm. So it's basically you invite them to experience or to do something where there is no way of doing it because it's, Mm -hmm. you anyway or it's so abstract mm -hmm. and thereby infusing the creative agency piece mm. too i mean we could do another one right now if you'd like something as simple as finding circles in your shoulders and the idea is to find what kind of circle in your shoulder feels best for you for your body And so we could do some comparisons, making the circle really big or making the circle teeny tiny and check in what size circle feels best in my body right now. It might be different from this morning or tomorrow. And so once you find the size you like, you could play with Another variable, maybe speed. Like, does it feel good to do my circles really fast? Or does it feel good to do them slow as molasses in the wintertime? Maybe one shoulder, maybe both shoulders, maybe forward, maybe backward. And you could be doing this seated, standing, lying down, walking across the room, And so the idea is to my challenge or puzzle to figure out is how to design a movement recipe that allows for all of it and that somebody can show up like, oh, I'm here for a workout and that extra oxygen to my brain is going to make me feel great and open my eyes. <laughs> or they could show up. I've had people battling cancer that show up in chairs. I've had I think the most elder person has been like in their early 90s. I have five, six year olds. And that, you know, that's a puzzle I love to solve. And that's, that's kind of belonging in the 
the macro and the design of it mm. is that anybody can show up. They can create their own circle and their own body and make art with that. And hopefully then walk away from that moment having just a increased pie slice of belonging to themselves. Like they feel at home in their own skin. Mm. It might not even feel good. It might feel painful, but that extra piece of wholeness or ownership feels mm. important. Yeah. Which reminds me of something you said earlier that it hopefully will feel a little bit comfortable, mm -hmm. uncomfortable, because that's where we grow and where we feel, feel alive. And what I like about that, the simplicity of the circles with the shoulders is how then we realize, or at least I realized in this little exercise you guided me through, how limited I am in my imagination. And you guiding through, adding layers and like, oh, yeah, I can do all of that. And what if I add my elbows? And then you spoke about lying down or sitting down or standing up. Yeah, there's so many dimensions that suddenly give me or spark curiosity in my own body in this movement. Oh, yeah. I love that. Sparks and ripples. That's an image that's been with me for a long time. Like to spark something new in someone and then to allow them to explore and experience the ripples of mm. what that is. And when I listen to you and the experiences you design, and also referring to the earlier experience, the art of play in Bali, it sounds almost as if language or verbal expression is something that is maybe absent or less important. So how do you refer to integration into sharing, speak or sharing with words? Or what is, how important is it actually to speak and verbalize or how, yeah, whiskey can it also be to break the experience? Hmm. So are you referring to when, like during the facilitation or are you referring to the sharing post experience? I Or both? Or both. I don't know how you, whether you speak, with, whether the participants speak. We use sound, but not very often do we bring words into it. Mm. Unfortunately or otherwise, the words actually become really important because what I don't want is a follow along. Like, well, if Kate's doing that, that's what I'm supposed to do. The visual cues can be helpful for people who might need some inspiration. And that's why uh, with my podcast, I, I very much appreciate that it's just the audio, but now I'm starting to realize I should put them on YouTube and I might use some silhouette art, which is a different conversation, but use some artistic way to inspire people for what shapes I might be referring to or, you know, other ideas for them to play with. But in, in a way there's a paradox because the, the power of the facilitation is the languaging mm. of me describing all of the different variables that you can find in your body. And on the other hand, the words do certainly get in the way. You know, we're carrying an entirely different kind of intelligence in the body. And our culture is so training us to just be in the brain all the time. And that we're thinking machines carrying around the sack of skin. And there's so much more knowledge in the body to tap into. Many times, If we do some kind of closing circle, whether it's a team building session or a public social movement event, and I like to do before and after comparisons, and a lot of people after will just make a sound or a movement because there's just something about words after that that, like you said, they kind of get in the way. So, like, how are you feeling right now? And it's, <laughs> or, or, you know, some kind of expression that we all understand that 
is not a word. Beautiful. And you mentioned team building. So I'm curious how does movement and the sense of belonging, or even the combination of both, how does it fit into the corporate world, the business, the team? Or how can you make it fit? <laughs> right. I'm jamming in there. I come from a corporate world. I started in finance and operations. And so I, I have the cubicle land lingo. I know that language. And I know how disembodied we are encouraged to be at work. It's stigmatized to bring your whole self to work. For the most part, corporate culture asks that you leave your body at home. Please just bring your brain and keep it working. Here's some sugar. Here's some coffee. And that what, what I find missing that I like to offer clients is a connection to the mission and an embodied why. I think that whether it's a one-person team or a 10,000-person team, there is opportunity that is not leveraged and it's way underutilized that each team member could connect with the mission of the organization or of the department or of the project. They could connect with that individually in their bodies and then there could be collective ownership of that as well and so <laughs> to take i guess kind of an ugly example but let's say coca-cola's mission is to refresh the world which is disputable but let's just say that that's true then every employee could be guided through Like, what is a fresh world for you? And what does refresh feel like in your body? And what are ways that you refresh your own world? You know, so there's a bit of coaching in there, but that we can bring it all back into the body. And then if we were to take the marketing team, let's say, and do some activities, games, around this idea of the theme of the mission of refresh the world, uh, we can use the body's intelligence to be driving the messaging from a place that is more heartfelt. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't actually take on clients like Coca-Cola. My threshold or my filter is that the organization or the project must be aiming to foster belonging in some way, which is a pretty wide net, and that we can build the frameworks for not only what it is to embody your mission, but then all the work we do from there ties to that, the strategic planning and the generating new revenue streams and optimizing internal processes and gaining a like holistic collective ownership of all of these business workflows, but from that lens of a personal relationship embodied to the mission. Sounds beautiful. And what I see is that it only works if the people actually do have a relationship if they're connected to the vision and the mission and they're willing to go there. Uh -huh. Which I think would come from leadership mm. because innately who doesn't want to show up to a job that fulfills a sense of purpose. And to get out what they work, whom they work for. Right. And understand that their one piece builds, you know, it, it feeds into this collective. But corporate world, they need research and science and mostly financial evidence that all of this is going to show up on the bottom line, which because I was a CPA, 
and sat at the boardroom table with the black suit, I, I am able to thread those together. That movement is good for the bottom line. Belonging is good for the bottom line. And there is science and research. And what? And there is science and research on the importance right. of embodied practice and using the body for that. Yeah. Loads of it. I, it seems like, I mean, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, of course, it's more prevalent than maybe other areas of the world that we are bringing, you know, the ping pong table in the Silicon Valley office was like this first weird tangible example maybe of like bringing bringing more of you to work and we could argue that that yeah there's all sorts of arguments around that but here in the bay area employees might be a little more used to different activities around embodiment around play around creative collaboration but still I, there is a strong divide between serious and we need to check the box to say we're doing this from the human resource perspective right and yeah. that 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 bridge needs to be needs to be built in a stronger way to show diversity isn't just skin color diversity is all of these experiences being human and allowing those to show up and that they will bring, they will absolutely bring value to everything that happens there. It's just a matter of creating structures that invite that and then leverage them. Beautiful. Beautiful in theory. <laughs> I think it gets messy in practice, but that's part of why I keep my scale small. Mm. And um, that's the perfect kind of bridge to two of my standard questions that I ask. Mm. So um, what remains your number one facilitation challenge then? When does it get messy? Mm. I think a couple of things come to mind. When I am not clear on purpose or I forget to make sure that whatever collaborative team I'm working with and the other stakeholders, if we're not all clear on the purpose and it's not crystallized enough, like if it's too general, then it doesn't help us make any decisions. But if we have a clear purpose in design and production, in who's invited to the table, in communicating that purpose, very clearly and completely to potential participants, then we'll, we'll minimize the mismatch and wasted resource that comes with that. I, I think another challenge I have is detaching from the outcome, mm. allowing space for surprise, for new branches of idea or activity or connection. I find it's a very fine line because I want to deliver. X, Y, Z, because I think it will add value and fulfill the purpose. But then, oh God, we're running out of time. This person wants to add a new ingredient into the mix. What am I going to do? You know, and I've failed miserably because of that a few different times. Which then brings a curiosity to my mind is, How do you prepare the participants for such a workshop? What is the communication? Because I can imagine that there is a fine line between catching their curiosity and scaring them away mm. just because it's so new mm -hmm. or uncomfortable. I mean, I think about the different events, workshops, teams, groups I've facilitated, and they run such a wide gamut that in some ways that makes it hard to answer the question for me. But I do believe that getting permission is really important. If you surprise people and ask them to do something in their bodies in front of other people without having 
set that up or I gained permission, uh, that's not going to work. <laughs> and you know, one one of the key criteria of play is that it's optional. Mm. And so almost everything I do that rides that line in that stretch zone, everything is by invitation. And I make it really clear that that's not just lingo, that that's mm-hmm. real, that you are 100% welcome to watch, to leave, to <laughs> add your own spice. And that goes back to that accessibility piece, just trying to make sure that no matter how people show up in the room, there's space for it. Mm. And how is it then with the observers? Because, for instance, for my workshops that are mostly talk shops, I I don't accept tourists mm-hmm. who flies on the wall. So mm-hmm. whoever is there participates also to keep the safe space. And I wonder if there's one group that goes there who dares to go and to be in this vulnerable space and then having observers who are maybe their boss, maybe their colleague. How does that feel? How do you prepare for that or deal with that? Mm -hmm. Well, one piece, hopefully it's not the boss because if the influencer or decision maker didn't buy in, then I probably won't be there. But I think it's taken care of for the most part in the arc of the activities to warm up, to build the safe space. And then also in the design of the activity where your shoulder rolls could be very, very, they might be invisible to the outside eye. Mm. And so to set it up in that way of, we don't know everybody's physical capacities, their aches and pains today, their level of comfort, but can we all commit to even imagining that your belly button is stirring a pot of chocolate, Mm. (laughs) you know? And in that way, I think you get collective permission that everybody's present with the material, even if they're not jumping around the room of that in your experience or in your opinion what makes a workshop fail i think the lack of purpose being clear if there's a misalignment there or if it wasn't made clear i think that will often fail i also think a lack of levity it's very rare that we are workshopping on something that's life or death. We're not transporting a kidney. And that, at least for me, to have that levity infused from the beginning is a superpower because it allows for mistakes, which then Mm -hmm. allows for more learning. But I also have a play button tattooed on my wrist. So I also might be guilty of always looking for what's fun or playful. (laughs) Although, how does the discomfort then feed into that? Mm, Discomfort. Say more, please. And actually, I might even answer that because in the beginning of the conversation, we spoke about discomfort and how it's something we want to embrace more. Mm. Mm, I see. Like embracing the pieces that normally we're taught we are taught are bad or mm. that can be playful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially if you take it to the extreme or I, I do a lot of playful self-talk and I don't know, this is me just working through it with curiosity, but I'll make a joke to myself like, Oh, Kate, look at you being jealous. And just, in doing that, mm. that little pull back the curtain, something 
something shifts over time. It's like if I have a habit that I am not proud of or that is detrimental to my health and I'm trying to get rid of it, I'm learning. This is, I'm very in process with this right now, but I'm learning that to try to notice it without the judgment is actually the the key. Like that's the effort. And that if I just keep noticing it softly, not slap me across the face or on the wrist, but to go, oh, look at you being jealous. And there's that too, that belongs. Tara Brock is a meditation teacher that I think she says, and that too, or something like that to say, like, well, that just adds to the pie. Beautiful. And what I love about the way how you phrase it, look at you being jealous or replace that by anything else you want to observe with curiosity, although it's unpleasant. It reminds me of stand-up comedy or the clown Mm. that holds the mirror and becomes funny or humorous by just stating what is without judgment. And letting everyone feel the discomfort of being observed yeah, in their humanity and failability. Totally. Yeah, clown, clown principles are really powerful. I'm learning more about them. But I love, yeah, I love that you brought that up. Hmm. And it invites for self-compassion. And it, isn't it also a, um, a coaching technique to just take the external view looking at ourselves? Or many different ancient wisdoms, like Buddhism being the observer. Mm, kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love that. Yeah. If someone would like to bring more movement into their lives and work, what would be your advice? Practice. A couple of things come to mind. One, I, I start each day with a song. and. I know that not everybody has the constitution to hop out of bed and be excited to dance like I do. (laughs) And I I don't want to make people wrong for not being that. I just happen to be a morning person. I always have been. But after I do a little bit of breathing, then I come out into the living room and I turn my phone on and I pick a random song on Spotify. I don't have to like it. It's just for sound. And then I say hello to my body by movement. So I might dance, I might stretch, I might shake, I might sway. And it's just a way for me to see where the body's at today and to say hello and to let myself know that it's a priority and it takes three minutes. And if I don't do it, I feel detached. Mm -hmm. Another thing would be what I call shake out or shake it up. I use it for timeouts from the screen or working. Uh, Like if I work half an hour, 45 minutes, I might stand up and do a one minute shakeout or stretching or jumping jacks. The important piece of it is the feeling part, like Mm -hmm. how we felt the champagne bubbles in the hands. Like the movement itself brings benefit. There's plenty of evidence for that. The piece that we're talking about with the belonging comes in the felt sense. The felt sense is the key tool. So the movement is as a means to a higher end. Totally. The movement, the play, and the creative collaboration, all three of those to me bring belonging. And then the last thing that comes to mind is that I try to start any gathering, whether it's a friend walk or a corporate meeting at the boardroom table, definitely a workshop with some kind of check-in. And that's become pretty standard, I think, but maybe not for 
the casual stuff. So like, hey, tell me where is your brain, your body, and your heart right now? Mm. Or can we do a 30-second wiggle together? And I call it the wiggle jiggle. And it it's amazing how impactful it can be, how much of a shift you can create, even to get more like meditative and toned down, like never underestimate the power of one full deep breath. Mm. The reason it's powerful is because you're paying attention to it. Thank you. I love the 30 seconds <laughs> wiggle. Wiggle, jiggle, wiggle, jiggle. I was yeah. just wondering how a, how a client would react or start a meeting. You know what? Let's shake it out for half a minute. And then we start talking. I think it really shift. It has the potential to really shift. Something. And start slow. I'm I'm so lucky to be newly mentoring a teenager who also was born with a cleft lip and palate like I was. And he's he's a little more insular and shy. And he exhibits the patterns I had as a kid with a facial difference. And I'm reminding myself of how to start slow, mm -hmm. right? And so we start with the, the heart, body, brain check-in. But then the next session we had, I was like, hey, can we try something? Like, it's just going to be 15 seconds. And we did the handshake thing. And so I think, you know, humans are built to move, like from the cells to the celestial stars. Like without movement, we're dead. And that uh, something deep inside wants to move. And so I believe that any context can fit, that it can be brought to any context. It's just a matter of how it's delivered. <laughs> Thank you so much. Look at you oh, opening your heart. Your hands went back like a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> or like for a hug. Or a hug, yes. yes. Thank Open. you, Kate. Oh, absolutely. It's been such a pleasure. And yeah, I feel so fortunate to be doing work that just lights me up and to be able to talk with kick-ass humans like you about it. Yeah, and share the love. I think uh, one can sense it. And I, I really appreciate the portal that you're using, the idea of facilitation and workshops just allows you to expand into so many other realms mm -hmm. because it's just a piece of being human. I suppose workshopping is humaning. And so I just think it's really cool what you're bringing to the world and fairly unique. I don't know of anyone else speaking specifically on facilitation and it's so needed. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening until the very end. I hope that you found the inspiration and the wisdom that you are looking for. And I hope that you will subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of the interviews with in another inspiring facilitator from across the world. I am devoted to continue this podcast and to deliver weekly an episode that maintains the quality that you expect and you deserve. And if you would like to help me to maintain this quality and to keep the podcast free, please help us visit workshops.org slash support to make a small donation to keep the podcast free. Thank you so much. I hope to be in your ears next week. <laughs>